Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to um, Visual Arts Speaker Series um, at UCSD, University of California, San Diego uh, Visual Arts Department. Our uh, series, uh, the selection committee is chaired by uh, Paul Supuya, joined by John Ali Glesias and myself, Panar Yoldash, as faculty members who are like helping organize this. And uh, the series is supported by Britain Family Foundation. Um, this week, I am most delighted uh, to uh, introduce Hyphen Labs, um, a, a group, uh, a team uh, that I've known for, I think, more than five or six years now, whose work I admire very much. Very young, very dynamic, very uh, high energy. Uh, titillating work uh, uh, they've been doing for uh, as long as I've known them. Known them. So today we have Carmen and, and Eche uh, from Hypen Labs uh, to talk about their projects. Very briefly, my introduction. I'm not going to keep it long so that they can talk about all the wonderful things that uh, you know they're working on themselves. Um, but uh, Hypen Labs, in a nutshell, is a design studio uh, that uses technology to explore absurdities that emerge at the intersection of technology, art, science, and the future. Um, Hyphen Labs uses design to challenge conventions and stimulate conversations, placing planetary needs and collective experiences at the center of our current evolving narratives. So um, without further ado, I'm uh, so happy to uh, uh, give to you, uh, present to you Carmen and Ejet. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, so Panar. Really exciting to be here. Uh, Hi, we, everyone. We really admire your work, actually. <laughs> and uh, I think we met you at IM Festival in Barcelona mm -hmm. 2018 or so and um, learned about the things that you're working on. and really inspired us. So we're happy to have that reciprocal admiration. Um, as Pinar mentioned, my name is Carmen. And I'm Ajay. We, we started Hyphen Labs in 2014. Well, there we go. So Ajay and I went to grad school together at EAC, which is a um, school in Barcelona based on advanced architecture techniques, parametric design, looking at 3D printing, uh, smart materials, interaction design. And so this was us preparing for our final project. Oops, sorry, one second. See the controls. Anyway, sorry. This is us preparing for our one of um, my final project. So we were always helping each other out in grad school, and now this is us. A couple of years later, we established a small studio after seeing that there were a lot of people doing what we wanted to do, but who weren't run. There weren't really many studios run by um, women, and we both come from like civil engineering and architecture disciplines. And we thought that there should be uh, more of us represented in our field. This, these are some of our amazing collaborators. Every single project that we have worked on so far has um, been in collaboration uh, because we love to incorporate alternative um, mediums that we may not have expertise in. We love to um, share each of our cultures, our languages, and we want to make work that speaks to, um, in a more global sense. Um, do you want to take this? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Some of our studio goals, before we jump into all of our projects, we just wanted to like share with you guys who we are and what we're curious about. Um, as a studio, we want to be inventive. We want to be able to experiment and explore whether that's new mediums or new foods uh, or new cities. Um, we want to cultivate. 
we want to collaborate and co-create with each other, but also with the community that we're in or the space that we're in. We love to work with our friends uh, so that we ourselves can be empowered. We like to play. Um, we like to make dollars or euros or pounds <laughs> as long as it's not using a proof of work model. Uh, we would love to save the planet. We're constantly needing to update the website <laughs> and um, we hope to make art, not just content. And through our, what collaboration does for us is it helps us foster the sense of belonging. And so when we collaborate, we want to create work that remixes disciplines, um, challenges our identities, examines what gender and sexuality is, language is, um, mixes cultures, incorporates and includes abilities and all ages. So we have made a couple projects. There's some very small ones. There's some big ones. Uh, there's physical ones and digital ones. And there are some collaborations and then some experiments. So we'll speak to you a little bit now about the projects that we've worked on. Um, and so Prismatic is the first one that we had in 2015. And Edge, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I think, so in our school, in the act too, we had all of these talks that were given by like architecture firms and big architects that we admire. And I always like wanted to know like what was their first project and how they talk about it and then how they get that project. So we always start with this. Like, so as Karen was mentioning, fresh out of school, we wanted to make all these like cool interactive uh, kinetic sculpture art. And luckily we were uh, commissioned to do one. Uh, so this is a, Carmen, can you go oh, yeah, to the sorry. next slide? I forgot I had the control. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is prismatic and it resides in a uh, bridge that connects two buildings in Highline. So it's kind of was like this dream place where we wanted to have our uh, work in. And the idea was to have this installation there that was gonna be sitting there for five years. So I wanted to make something that was subtle enough and then not necessarily attacking people, but also changing every day. And one thing that we wanted to kind of maybe make that uh, bridge more special to was to bring the weather outside in. So I wanted to uh, visualize the weather outside. And we used, um, basically we used these, so this is actually inside uh, uh, Google and we wanted to use the advertising, uh, these triangles, these triangle prism, prisms that were, we they used to have in 60s, where it was like rotating and it would each rotation would show a different uh, advertisement. But we wanted to obviously add a kick and make it a bit more three dimensional. So it could kind of like make this building more flowy. So what we did is just tapered one side and created an apex and try to bring the weather in with light and uh, rotation speed and um, different sorts of uh, interaction with uh, reflections using mirrors, etc. I think we had the uh, video, but so this was kind of like our dream project after we graduated, but then we were like, okay, so we did this. So what's going to be next? Like, what do we do, you know? And uh, so after that, we, started to do our actually our own projects and I'm going to have Carmen explain neurospeculative Afrofeminism. So NSAF was a project that we developed in 2016 with our collaborators Ashley Bacchus Clark and um, Nitsan and we were working we were living in New York and this was during the time that there was a lot of police brutality um, against Black Americans, and we wanted to somehow respond to it and make a project. This was also a time when um, VR was kind of developing and not super mainstream, and people didn't have quests in their homes necessarily. So we started by creating a project off of the premise of well, what would 
the world look like if black women were the pioneers of brain science? And we, we were thinking about objects that we could develop uh, that would be like speculative. We were looking at the, at the um, what would you call it? The consumer like retail market and saw that um, it was super hot in New York when we were there and Ashley was looking for sunscreens that wouldn't have like such a in, intense zinc component and like turn her skin from the like beautiful brown black color to this like gray color, um, which didn't feel reflective of who, who she is. And so we started out by creating an object which would be uh, UV beams, which would be a clear sunscreen. And then we were thinking about, okay, that protects us from like the sun, because what if we're out in the um, multiverse? What if we're out in the stars closer to the sun? There's um, certain like lies that we've been told that, oh, black people don't need sunscreen, when really everybody needs protection, especially as the ozone uh, layer becomes thins and, um, like we can't depend, uh, and it's actually not scientifically proven that melanin um, will protect um, the skin. So from like cancers. So we decided to create this roster of other objects as well. We had ear have earrings that have embedded audio and video in them in order to begin to record police brutality based on capacitive touch. We have a microaggression deflecting visor, which is also um, the first place where we started to see where do our physical objects bleed and blend into our digital virtual world. We created a scarf with, um, with Adam that what is about um, confusing computer vision algorithms and our most speculative object is the Octavia electrodes that when connected in our virtual space, um, allows you to con connect to something that we call the synaptic lineage. So we were working on this like physical story. This We wanted to answer this question because we were watching, Ashley's like a, a very curious about neuroscience and we were watching one of a lecture from a professor can't remember at this moment um, where she was, but she was asking where are all the black women neuroscientists. And we were like, well, if she's asking that question, then maybe we can also um, ask that. And what would it look like if they had made, had made leaps and bounds into the future? And um, so we decided to transform sal salons and beauty salons into neurocosmetology labs where not only in the physical space you could go to the beauty salon but there you could also get your um get it, your octavia electrodes and have your synapses pruned and um so in our physical space you enter a uh like a, a small installation that looks like it could be a salon. It has um, content about our characters, about neuroscience. And then you go into a, when you put the VR headset on, you go into a digital salon. And we were really curious at this point, and it didn't really exist, like the, um, like matching the physical and digital spaces. A lot of the VR experiences that we were going to had really minimalistic kind of black boxes that you would sit in and then you would be in like, you know, the Arctic. And we found that there was a big like cognitive dissonance for the whole experience. So we wanted to begin to integrate the two and show our objects in our virtual worlds as well as use our virtual worlds as a way to like reframe um, like reframe our reframe narratives, incorporate our objects, and have tell the beginning of a story. So I'll show you a small teaser. We were also working through the fact that like in 2016, there were no really beautiful avatars that we, we could use. They were all like, especially like Black and Latina and um, like 
identities were very sexualized. So we wanted to create our own characters and our own spaces that felt high tech, that felt scientific, that felt um, empowering. So we got to work with character modelers and begin to build characters that we felt represented us in a more authentic way. Um, and so that was really, really exciting and fun. And that was probably, um, and I think it's still an important um, project that we hope to continue working on. So there's our little teaser. Um, from there, we ended up working with Oculus uh, to put it on the um, market, the, what is it called? Like to put the it, make store. it. On yeah, the, the Oculus Store, exactly. So it could be accessible um, as well as on YouTube because there was a big um, difference between like having it in, in your headset and then having it like physically accessible and getting it out to more people. Um, so once that project finished, uh, we signed with a commercial uh, production company called Missing Pieces. And we found that our work, we wanted to be, we wanted to work in both the commercial side of work and also the artistic side. So, um, Edja, you want to talk about this one? No, go ahead. I'll... Okay. Um, so the National Safety Commission approached us with a um, with a quest with a, a project that was all about the opioid epidemic. Um, we lose up to like 80 to 90,000 people a year from um, opioids and opioid related incidents. And it's becoming a, and, and it is a huge problem that we somehow wanted to address and um, showcase. So we, they asked us to design a installation, an exhibition where we could use emerging technologies to um, create like the, an, an individual's face inside one of these opioid, um, and inside of a pill, and then display the representation of like the 22,000 people who actually pass away a year from pharmaceutical opioids. So we designed an infinity room that um, not only showcases the 22,000 um, pill faces, but also with the mirrors kind of extends that to the families that are affected and um, those people who are uh, affected by like opioid adjacent issues. So we also created a website that um, where you could add your own story, you could create your own memorial so that people could be in community and um, speak and see kind of and map out some of the like where people are and share their stories. And I'll show you a short video so you can see a little bit. And he took his last breath. This wall has 22,000 pills, each carved with a face. Michael's story is just one of them. This wall was also um, had small tags so that there were like individual stories that you could that's see Michael's once story. you're there. Um, and so this was like a installation design. Oops, sorry. Um, not just showcasing the the wall itself, but also we had a uh, micro CNC router that was carving a face every 22 minutes. He took his last breath. Um, which is the rate at which somebody passes away from opioids. And that project um, had, because it was a commercial project, it had a lot more visibility. It ended up going to um, the White House as well as like smaller places in um, on the East Coast. But yeah, it ended up being quite a big project. So also, also one big thing I think was to, to mention is that 
part of the campaign because we were giving out warn me labels. Mm -hmm. So whenever you would, so whenever you would go to a doctor, he would show that uh, label say, saying that if you are prescribing me with opioids, because a lot of people do not know that they're taking opioids. And how um, addictive they are. And how addictive they are. So we were giving out these uh, warning labels so people could use it. Uh, and Put it on their insurance cards. Yeah, are more a bit aware of it. Um, and then, so until this moment, we were working far away from each other. Carmen was in the US, I was in Spain. And then we uh, got a residency in London, Somerset House, where after a couple of years, we could just be together in the same city, in the same time zone and work together next to each other and while in uh, London we were commissioned by uh, the Tate and we were selected as the lead artists to run a year-long program uh, in their uh, fifth floor where they call it the Tate Exchange. So each year Tate uh, selects a topic and gives this floor, this huge floor to an artist uh, to create a bit of a more an interactive space for the museum visitors so it's doesn't it's it's not just like a white cube doesn't it's not like a white cube gallery but people can actually come and have conversations and uh, add their kind of like voices to the conversation that's happening there and our topic was power and we were so it's always it's most of the time like a one word so the artist makes the uh, it's artist take on what to make out of it. And we were thinking, what's the most powerful thing in our lives? And we were just like technology and we have to talk about technology. So in this project, we wanted to uh, turn this whole space into uh, a representation of the digital spaces that we are uh, uh, in, ex in exhibiting in or uh, being in, living in. And we wanted to uh, start the conversations of how does the technology have power on us by giving, by, by making very, very simple kind of analogies uh, with all the technology that we use. And it started with a kind of like a troubleshooting diagram on the floor. So when you first entered, you were asked, how did you get here? And how did we get here? It's kind of like a big uh, question, but it's, it was to, ask people okay did you get here by plane or car or by walking and by that we were trying to have them uh, imagine and think about all of the data that they've been sharing with the technologies that they interact each and every day and the whole floor was actually divided into four large spaces each one of them had a different um, transparency with privacy in the tech for example the uh, we had the town hall which was a kind of like a representation of twitter you don't necessarily have to need to have an account you can just like go there and just see the conversations and sometimes have your uh, uh, voices heard we had the park bench which is kind of an analogy for facebook where you could go and you have to log in to kind of uh, interact with it. Otherwise you don't have access and you can see, depending on the privacy settings, you can see other people's conversation, et cetera. And then we had the living room, which was a representation of a WhatsApp group. It's more private, you are invited in there. And then um, in that space, we were talking about uh, a bit more, we had more intimate conversations there. And then the last place was the loo which is kind of like your uh, DMs and your pri really, really private conversations where, so in all of these places, we, so it was kind of like a small festival. We also curated artist talks, performances, a lot of different events in these uh, four spaces, kind of correlating to the um, transparency of the privacy in that space. So this was a tarot reading and, in, in other places, we had the yin yoga where we could just kind of like refresh our uh, privacy settings. And actually, one thing I forgot to mention is that this troubleshooting diagram, uh, after you answered a couple of yes and no questions, you would end up in this stop that future wall where we were talking about the uh, features that 
kind of um, say attack you or directed at you or targeted at you, depending on the data that you've been sharing. Here, for example, you're seeing facial recognition, emotion recognition, political prediction and targeting. So people uh, would use their thumbs with an ink and then leave their likes on wherever they end up. So we wanted to make sure, we, we wanted to just talk about how the data that they've been shedding while using say Instagram, Facebook, Gmail, and all TikTok now, how, how, can, how can those technologies can come and affect their, uh, their, their lives? So um, as I was mentioning, we had different uh, artist installations there. This was stealing your feelings. Um, it was a kind of who was the Neil Noah Stevenson's project. Uh, you guys should actually go out, check it out. Uh, on it's I think it's online. We had. Can you go to the next one, Carly? Uh, we carried uh, a Facebook cross um, to kind of represent the death of our privacy uh, around the Tate. Um, next one. Oh, we had a couple, we had a couple of yet yeah, other performances where one of them was you would uh, tape your thumb so you couldn't use your uh, telephone and then you had to perform in Tate. We also had a uh, kind of cleansing day with the crypto. Um, sorry, this was like a, uh, before pandemic, before pandemic times. Uh, but anyway, we had, we like had a 40, 40 different artists and collaborators and we had like lunchtime talks mm -hmm. and yeah, as, as we were saying, we were trying to increase the public's general vocabulary around algorithms and privacy because mm -hmm. we don't act the same way in real life as we do online. And we're shedding a lot of um, important data online. And we wanted to give people kind of a, a basis um vocabulary to begin to talk about these these real problems that are showing up in um politics and that are you know the technology is developing so fast that our governments are really behind so when it comes to emotion detection or um like facial recognition how that's being used at airports, um, we, we want people to, to know what they're doing when they scan their faces or scan their eyeballs. And Mozilla Foundation was actually a big part mm -hmm. of it. And then it was the time after The Great Hack, the movie where uh, it was talking about Cambridge Analytica. So we had the uh, viewing of that and we had a panel with all the people who created The Great Hack. So this was a kind of like, a, uh, I think our most public facing but like mm -hmm. physically public facing project and we kind of had to cater it to a, a big audience because I mean Tate is visited by like, international people from like age zero to let's say 110 so it was it was a bit it, it was a nice challenge to kind of think about how can we make all of these information accessible um next project we want to talk about is uh, as I mentioned, we are residents in Somerset House, and in Somerset House, we are commissioned. Uh, we are lucky, actually, super, super lucky to be commissioned to a couple of exhibitions that um, they curate there. This is part of the exhibition called Twenty Four Seven. Uh, it was the it was it was actually based on the uh, same book by Jonathan Crary, uh, and. So the so what that book talks about is how our sleep is the last place that hasn't been um, invaded by technologies, and then how Netflix kind of uh, says that their only rival is sleep because we can't consume in our sleep. So all of the, the so the so this Paul uh, exhibition was talking about how capitalism is just ingrained in all all corners of our life, and. As Carmen was mentioning, we kind of like we like adding some humor in our work, and this was the kind of I think the best option, uh, best opportunity to kind of do that. So at the beginning of the fest uh, exhibition, we placed this photo booth where, uh, when you're in, you are shown a small clip of a lot of people yawning, and while you're in mid yawn, the 
machine learning, uh, sorry, the, the, the camera that's been trained on capturing yawns captures your yawn. And then once you finish uh, visiting the exhibition, at the end of the exhibition, you're kind of confronted with your own yawn. Um, so this was kind of like our call to action or call to yawn for the whole London so that they could kind of calm down, maybe go to sleep and then not necessarily consume while they're uh, in this space. So this is a couple of uh, snapshots we got from uh, the photo booth. Very I, tired I, London that we hope yeah, to make a, a yawn opera out of. Yeah. Um, I just want to show this small video we were showing inside the photo booth. It's tough to quit scrolling. Just ask any of the 2.71 billion smartphone users who continue to browse regardless of the toll on their sleep. Our sleep is in danger. Corporations list sleep as a primary business competitor, designing addictive interfaces to keep us on the conveyor belt of consumption. If capitalism's quest is to control all of human life, sleep is our last resistance. So what can you do? In a world in which sleep itself becomes an act of resistance, yawning can get us there. Sleep will save us. Yawn, and yawn often. Yawn for your right to sleep and dream. Yawn to resist the commodification of sleep. Enjoy a yawn today. This broadcast has been developed for 24-7 by Hyphen Labs. Side effects may include drowsiness, snoring, comfort, dreams, rest, regular heart rate, pain relief, energy, good humor, good complexion, appetite, optimism, and productivity. To join the resistance, turn off all notifications and all electronic devices. Here ends the reading of the Gospel according to Yawn. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, do you want to do this, Carmen? Sure. And so that was, as Ajay said, that was our... Um, like our attempt at making a weapon of mass sleep or <laughs> to get everyone to go to sleep and stop consuming um, so that we could maybe like reset. And um, it's funny that it happened, I think right before it was the winter, right before um, COVID happened. And then uh while COVID happened, we had a commission at uh, Sharing Stiftung, actually, which where, which is where we saw Pinar's amazing work, Ecosystem of Excess. And um, we were asked to collaborate with a neuroscientist, John Dylan Haynes, who runs the, he's a professor, he runs the Charité University's neuroscience department. And um, his research, some of the things that he's looking at is the questions around like free will and do we have it? His um, research re involves brain activity and trying to look at how decisions are made and that our brain actually makes decisions potentially seven seconds prior to the point at which we become conscious of those decisions. And so we wanted to use um, individual robots in order to look at our relationship with consciousness. Um, we wanted to somehow relate, take Roombas, which are these household objects and ask the question of, can we give them free will? Can we simulate the individual action and collective action using swarm intelligent algorithms to define free will and understand some of the um, deterministic points of view as well as the like libertarian per point point of view or the compatibilist point of view. Libertarians believe that our decisions are 
not constrained by the deterministic nature of our world, um, that there is total free will. Compatibilists believe that it doesn't matter if our decisions are controlled um, by the constraints of the deterministic nature as long as the as our decisions follow what we want, that there is also some free will. And then hard determinists believe that our decisions are totally constrained by the determinist nature of the world and that there really is no free will. And our neuroscientist believes that decisions are constrained by the deterministic nature of our brain and that there's also no free will. So we are trying to answer this question, uh, which has, which is a really complex question and has been um, asked by artists and philosophers and thinkers for um, thousands of years. So it wasn't that we were necessarily trying to come up with an answer, but we wanted to make a project that allowed individuals to answer that question them, themselves and for themselves. So um, can an individual's action be predicted and what happens to our collective behavior. So what we did was we have a network of agents here. Um, we are also creating or looking at the mind and body problem of like, where is consciousness? Um, does it, is it inside our heads and where are our thoughts? So if our physical bodies um, are the rocks on top of the Roombas and the Roombas are our decision-making or our brains, then the balloons that are attached to the rocks are kind of the consciousness. And what happens as um, the, we had two pedals, one for a more deterministic algorithm, one for more of a free will algorithm. We were using um, like one was diffusion, one was a diffusion algorithm, the other was a more follow the leader algorithm. Um, and we had some interesting, I'm trying to see if I can make this over here. Oh, no, we had some interesting things happen in this space where people would watch the, the Roombas move around and they would see how the balloons would entangle with each other and they would begin to create their own stories um, and like almost anthropomorphize these, these small robots. We also had a um, boundary around the space, which was kind of a metaphor for the rules that determine our society with a small trap door that the Roombas could leave out or escape and like escape this, this space as well. Um, and so sometimes the like balloons would get entangled. Sometimes they, there would be like the, um, robots would all follow each other. And um, we were just really surprised at how long people would stay in the space, trying to say, and and almost like mirroring their own experiences and, and onto the robots themselves. And then our most recent project that has just, um, actually been launched is a project called Insidious Rising. This was a commission with Google Arts and Culture. Um, it's, Edja, do you want to speak about this one? No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, this is, this is our first kind of web-based project. We were asked to respond to the 2019 IPCC report. Uh, we'll give you a small video to intro this. Um, for their project, Heartbeat of the Earth, which invites artists to respond to climate data so that somehow we can represent what's happening to the larger um, public. <laughs> Rising sea level. Ice sings a goodbye song. 
expanding oceans toward city tops, how will a glacier be remembered? Where do the animals run when we have no water left? So this was a really special project for us um, because we were really actually inspired by a news story that came out um, about how the cryosphere holds actually like million year old bacteria. And I think in 2012 or so there was like a young child in Siberia who drank some water which had been poisoned by anthrax from a deer that had been infected with it and had, had and the deer had thawed out and somehow um, infected the water and so we were like wow then this was in 2019 when we started developing this it was March 2019 and we were like well, if all of our cryosphere thawed and millions of bacteria would be released into the into the world, what would it look like if we had a pandemic? And then um, it was like that was in March, and we started developing things. And by November, it was like, well, that's gonna that seems like awfully close to what's happening. Um, November, December, February. March came around in 2020 and we were like, wow, this is actually happening. And it, it's not just an isolated incident of just the cryosphere thawing, but there are cascade effects that um, entang and climate change is entangled with sea level rise, cryosphere thaw and accelerated warming. So we decided to make a, a mobile application for using um, 3JS and WebGL to try to create something that um, was explored a linear story, um, looking at rising sea levels, accelerated warming and um, cryosphere thaw and finding real events that have happened and kind of placing them all together, but creating a very simplified, easy to read, easy to experience, um, website that also looked at what will happen between like one point the 1.3 and two degrees warming because oftentimes we find that that change is really difficult to quantify we don't understand what two degree warming really looks like so we take our users down um, three storylines while uh, melting our, our glacier and then lead us to a final page that talks about the fact that for a lot of individuals, climate change is already here and that there are stewards who are leading the um, fight against climate change with their communities and showcasing them. Um, one of the few, most, the nicest part about this collaboration was being able to um, work with Allison Akchuk Warden, who is a Inupiaq indigenous artist uh, who lives in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, because our call to action is really that we need indigenous leadership in order to um, to meet the climate crisis head on, and we need to be listening and looking to them as as leaders, and they need to have a voice in this. So she um, was a, an incredible collaborator that is the voice of our glacier. I just want to add one more thing to that. So in order for to advance in the story in, in Cities Rising, we wanted to have a touch uh, interaction on the mobile so when you're touched when you touch the screen the screen gets starts getting hotter so it's kind of like an anal analogy for like how our human touch is um impacting the glaciers and we wanted to really keep it simple but powerful so people can understand how uh their uh 
their behavior is affecting them. Because like, as Carmen is saying, I think um, the, the, gla- the uh, Ellison was the voice of the glaciers. And I guess it was, who was that? It was Bernie Krauss who said that um, we need to hear the voices of nature in order to, I think, moderate our behavior. So we kind of need to uh, hear this from the people who are kind of uh, at the forefront of uh, climate crisis fight. So um, that those are our most recent projects. So we wanted to also, in our last 10 minutes, talk a little bit about what it's like um, in our studio and what makes um, collaboration challenging as well as what makes it successful. So we wanted to tell you guys about some blind spots uh, before going into big collaborations to be aware of. So that would be um, hungry collaborators. Uh, being mindful of language. Um, What really hurts collaboration are things like unsafe spaces and um, what makes collaboration really can be really difficult is sometimes the legal stuff like not having contracts, assuming that we'll deliver because we're friends, not having insurance, poor time management, poor communication, um, not having a clear scope of work so that the expectations are managed, what we're delivering and what we expect from each other. Um, There's no surprises. And what we found is it's really important to communicate about uh, timeline, budget, fabrication. Um, We did a lot of, we worked for a really long time without taking any breaks, without having weekends. And that was really um, challenge, that really slowed our collaborations down and always defaulting to like what the normal, what normal business is or how business is done um, and having like unbalanced responsibilities or micromanaging each other, feeling too attached to projects or to the outcomes, taking things personally, focusing on like, oh, we did this in the past and we want it to be as big or as good and then saying no instead of practicing like the yes and. Um, And then things that make collaboration really good are being flexible, um, taking risks, asking lots of questions, even if like makes you feel (laughs) not very good or you're uh, insecure about it, like do it anyway. Um, Meeting each task with enthusiasm, even if you're not that enthusiastic about it. Um, So like taking an acting class, uh, (laughs) moving the office, taking meetings outside. For us, it's really changing the medium so that we're always beginners. We're always doing something for the first time, which isn't necessarily um, what we we know. Let's see, uh, exercise, oh yeah, the deep commitment to like kicking it and hanging out. Like this is something for us and our collaborators. It's it's really important, I think, to have the like off time where yeah, you're working together, but also when are you like hanging out and getting to know each other and like caring with for each other and, and with each other. And I um, think, sorry, Carmen, just want to add here. And I think it's since... COVID, this has been so tough. Yeah. And we, this has been, we've been obviously uh, working throughout the pandemic as well with new groups of people. And you can really see how not hanging out and not really having that connection sometimes really hinders the collaboration itself. So this is, I mean, I- And the trust we're, we're, too. And the trust as well, yeah. yeah. So like, especially when we're doing all of these like emotional work, we, you definitely need to have that uh, time. Just wanted to add that. Mm-hmm. Um, we like to break stuff and then like put it back together um, or fi- figure out where the holes are. We like to do exercises in like problem solving as well as just like improv, weird improv exercises. Um, we like to like when the collaboration does get stale or gets weird, we like to somehow try to like rebalance 
so that we can like grow the mental garden and then cultivate it um, using trust as a currency, um, thinking about how our, what our individual agency is and how our collective can have action, being committed to resilience and resolution, being committed to the long game. Um, I think, a, you know, there's, especially in the kind of world of startups and like entrepreneurship, it's really easy to like say like, okay, well, I'm going to try this new thing. I'm going to try this other thing. I'm, we're going to try this other thing. But if we stay really committed and um, commit to our collaborations, then it, it's really helpful um, when realizing a project. Um, always having unlimited tea and snacks in the studio. And coffee. <laughs> and, and coffee and chocolate. Um, and also working on ourselves because like AJ and I are not the same people that we were when we met eight years ago and when we started uh, Hyphen Labs together. Um, and we've committed to evolving the studio, but also evolving ourselves. Um, and we've just embraced email and Zoom and WhatsApp so that we can, um, we can like be in communication. And then it's really important for us to play and to rest. So as we're finishing up here, oh, we wanted to show you guys a little bit of like what, it, what our joys are and what our challenges are. Uh, how we like experiment and tinker to like, we're trying to incorporate critical thinking into our work from the innovation and design side to like the play side and then cross pollinating between um, disciplines. And then obviously the challenges are um, that became even stronger are that like, sometimes we're always online and we always see, only see each other online. Um, there's like capitalistic challenges, like we need to pay each other, we need to figure out like how to start a business, we need to figure out what taxes do we have to pay, like the stuff that's not so fun. <laughs> um, and then like what the like politics are in, in each person's space, um, what their personal politics are, their personal processes um, all the can things differ that, from ours. All the things that you don't learn at school. <laughs> Point that. And then the questions that we have found that are um, we need to be prepared for always is like, so which part did you do? And who made this for you? What exactly does it mean? And why did you make it? And the our favorite question is, what's next? So for us right now, we are working hard to keep the future interesting. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm giving you a digital uh, hands up. Um, I have so many questions. Uh, this is fantastic to hear from you, uh, your wonderful projects and the process. I have so many questions, but um, I want to prioritize our, uh, you know, audience, and we have a couple questions that are coming from YouTube. So I'll, I'll, uh, you know, basically read them first in case, um, you know, the participants need to go, etc. Because uh, this is an interesting format, right? Um, the first question is from Yushua. Hi, Yushua. Thank you so much for joining this talk. Um, and uh, this is about the uh, opioid uh, faces project. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Yushua is asking, how are these opioid faces uh, disposed af later after the exhibition? Interesting question. We never got this question. And yeah, that's a really, really good question, actually. Well, I just want to say it's as a kind of like a maybe a uh, studio secret. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't want to use we didn't want to use uh, real opioids for exactly the same reason. Like, how are we gonna get um, dispose of them later on? So they're uh, actually opioid shaped plasters that were casted. Uh, we casted twenty two thousand plasters, so they're not actually real med medicines because 
it's an exhibition where it's like public facing. There are a lot of people coming in and there's a CNC kind of working full time. So we didn't want to leave it to, we didn't want to leave it open and so people could take it and just, uh, you know, use it. So, but yeah, great thinking. Never had this question before. And we have a big bag of, of them because yeah. the, the ones in the wall were like, I think they were like resin based prints and the, or they were casts maybe. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones were plaster that we would uh, CNC into. And I'm surprised, Carmen, you were you managed to bring them uh, from US to London in a bag. Yeah. <laughs> in your luggage. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. You're on mute. Yeah, I was just thinking about all the objects I carried in my luggage over the years yeah, <laughs> the right. conversations you have at the airport yeah the customs yeah. officers like pulling like what is this what is yeah. this that's a part of my installation yeah as an artist i think the check-in begins three hours before the flight you have yeah, to go exactly. yeah uh, well, speaking with your babies of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. speaking of advice for when you're, you know, like for after school, make sure that you get out, get 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 at the airport uh, quite early if you yeah. have to uh, move work with you with you, which is what I do all the time because that's actually if you're installing, it's more convenient and less um, how to say it um, uh, costly in terms of shipping. So it does exist. So this is great. Now let's. Um, there are two more questions I have to read. So uh, Clarissa, hi Clarissa. Um, is asking, she's one of our graduate students, um, as artists working in such interdisciplinary spaces, uh, what are some of the most surprising places that you've found funding slash support outside of traditional art world supports? Great question again. Yeah, I mean, that's why we have a commercial side of our work <laughs> and an artistic side of our work. But, but I think just actually, go ahead. Uh, with COVID, actually, it's interesting. Like a lot of people, I don't want to say a lot of people, but let's say more people than before, maybe kind of are more aware of the artist situations because that was the first funding to go. No, like the arts and design and all those fundings. And in Somerset House, actually, we had a kind of, like a, I would say, a patron or like a mentor that just came and kind of helped with our uh, rent. So there are many different types of kind of uh, support that um, comes from many different places. And Somerset House was really helpful for us to kind of keep our studio space because that's really important for us to have this space um, throughout the pandemic, even if we don't go there, it's just nice to keep. And then it's a really, really great network and uh, group of people to be part of. So that was, I think, one of the interesting places we got uh, support. It was mm -hmm. a, a kind of like a friend of Somerset House that helped us with paying our rent. Mm -hmm. They also, with our project NSAF, we, we were looking for funding everywhere. And it was actually Intel's anthropology department that ended up supporting us with in-kind donations and uh, like a budget that helped us get mm -hmm. you know do the whole thing but they were really i i failed to mention that in that project we were looking at the idea that we fear what we don't know and that vr could potentially give us a mm -hmm. more intimate experience with black women scientists mm -hmm. and and maybe change our implicit bias so we had also set up a research around seeing how implicit bias changed from take from like before the vr and then watching the vr and then after the vr mm. and um we found that it doesn't change much in adults but in young girls it expands like thousands of percents in terms of how they can see themselves in the world of technology. So we, they were working your mute. I, I was just gonna say, not just young girls, I think young boys as well. I remember that young one kid, it's just young people. Young yeah. Kids, yeah. 
like younger people, not the ones who already have their their biases really fully formed, um, mm -hmm. especially like old conservatives. But um, so that was a really interesting way that we incorporated a research aspect and then were able to get funding based on the more of the the mm -hmm. science behind the the research rather than um, just like we're making a piece and we're looking for um, founders. They were really curious to see how it affected bias. And I, th I think one thing that was interesting about that project was that at that time, there wasn't a lot of VR pieces that you would see yourself. You were usually just seeing your hands. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in our project, you were sitting in front of a mirror where you would embody another another person. So I think it was really powerful for kids to mm -hmm. be able to see themselves in another body. Also for uh, grown-ups, I think it was, it was kind of like a nice moment because you would put the headset on the people and then they would automatically take the uh, position of the the character in there mm -hmm. and it was nice it was nice to see that you they would be just like kind of embodying that uh character in there so i think that mm -hmm. was maybe interesting for intel's anthropology um uh, research as well mm -hmm. um oh am i muted we have no. a few more questions you. and um one of them is also from yushu uh, who is one of our speculative design undergraduates and then the other one is uh, from Jessica. Um, the first one is the visualization, uh, I guess, like the ones you, you, you know, your visual visualizations is really effective. Will there be more simulations of different scenarios? For instance, types of geography, geographies, RCP trajectories. I'm trying to this find out. For the insidious. This yeah, is for insidious. Yeah. yeah. So we use the eight point, the RCP projection, the 8.5, which we really believe is like more close to reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like, I think the, in the ideal world, Carmen, I think mm -hmm. we would, I, I mean, and I, you would probably too, like we would actually wanted to connect to it real time data, no? Mm -hmm. Like so that you're seeing it, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure you also know Punar, like everybody else, to like all the scenarios that they're creating changes constantly. Like in like two months and three months, like it's so hard to predict what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. we wish to have kind of start adding a lot of different trajectories, but it's just like getting more grim and grim and grim and every day. So how do we yeah, keep up with the data? No, mm -hmm. I think where what would be really interesting and this is for me maybe a bit that would be a different project is also developing the, the second part of the story because we're already living in this like horror story and mm -hmm. where are the resources for us to con that are co that for us to connect with those individuals who and be a part of like mm -hmm. the fighting against the climate crisis mm -hmm. and so how could that but but those individuals are also like w very busy, like fighting and um, trying mm -hmm. to work in their communities and with their um, mm -hmm. with their spaces. Um, so that I think would be an interesting mm -hmm. way to to continue the project. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we don't see any. Um, like future visualizations of other scenarios no. Yeah, very true. Um, I'm going to move to the next question um, in anticipation of other questions. Uh, for those of you uh, who are with us, what are your questions? You can type in the uh, YouTube uh, streaming channel and then we can uh, address it to Carmen and Edge immediately. So what are your questions? I'm not going to ask if you have questions, because I know you do. Now, Jessica is asking, I think all the projects from your lab is amazing, exclamation <laughs> mark. I was wondering what should we be aware when we are addressing some negative scenarios or eschatological presumption? And if you, I pronounce it right. Um, you can Google what that means. No, yeah, I typed it <laughs> so you can see it. Um... I'm not sure. What, do you know what that means, Ajay? 
English. Well, I was English actually going to ask you. English is my, English is my second. <laughs> English is my second language too. <laughs> okay. Uh, the so part it, of theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. Wow, that's a huge question. Yeah, relating to death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul. <laughs> yes. It's what a, should we be aware of when it Jessica, good, someone, good, good one, Jessica. Question, good word. The negative scenarios. It's like a Jerry word, but oh, um, I think you? like this is this this question resonates with me too because you know when you make projects about the end of the world, like you know uh, climate crisis oceans without fish by 2048 these are not you know speculative well, scenarios exactly. actually that's, that's right why and, we wanted so to create. I, I think that's that's where the word comes mm -hmm. uh, yeah. where, the, where the word emerges from so um yeah i'm really personally curious to hear yours your uh experience regarding this uh, first thing that you have to be aware of, I think, is your mental health. And I just want to shout out to a lot of people who are researching these things every day. I mean, we're artistically approaching this, so we can somehow not necessarily divorce ourselves entirely, but there are people actually working on these things every day. So you kind of really have to be, this is not the, the answer to your question, I think, but I we have to be aware of how what they're going through mm -hmm. and make sure that they get the support that they need mm -hmm. and personally for me like these conversations need to be addressed mm -hmm. um and i think like this question also has two uh maybe two ways of answering it one like how do we accept death uh because culturally i think we're not necessarily or ritually we're not necessarily understanding the life cycle and how everything is transforming into one another and how everything's entangled this is one but this is kind of like the natural uh way of life mm -hmm. but the uh, but the other part i think um this is like we we cannot so one thing that we wanted to do with insidious rising is that you yeah you talk about this horror story this horror movie but you cannot leave people hopeless you know like i guess like there's a lot of climate anxiety and i'm sure like panar you're also mm -hmm. uh working on that you're like talking about that you know but how do we make sure we give people the resources and not just tell them like bring your coffee cup to the your uh coffee store and ride your bicycle to work but actually give them the tools to talk about to uh with everybody around themselves to kind of make this maybe mm -hmm. massive uh action that we all need to take all together so so that we can help each other i don't know carmen what do you think yeah i mean i, I see the climate anxiety as a very western problem too because it's a lot of individuals who are sitting inside this their big cities who are worried about some future catastrophe. But when the reality is that those who are experiencing the like crisis right now need, need mm -hmm. support. So I think that when, when we're talking about this, it's really important to showcase the, like those communities that really are experiencing now, experiencing mm -hmm. it now, um, rather than just getting stuck in the like loop of okay like my children aren't going to have trees when they are 30 years old and they're you know going to be living in these like very speculative scenarios with wildfires all the time and we do mm -hmm. have the the opportunity to um change that and i think whether it's um splitting your time between you know, the, the hard tech that you're doing and the kind of soft like world cultivation that and the, there's like a lot that we can physically do when we get outside of our our studios and our universities and our minds that that's really helpful. So like what um, and and I guess we have to have the collective action to pressure our governments and and 
talk to and try to like talk to our family members, especially the ones who don't think that there's a problem and mm -hmm. um, kind of somehow like fold them into the conversation and make them feel not like calling out, but like calling in. Um, mm, I love that actually calling in. It's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, this is, let me see. And, try, and also like we try to reframe of like, rather than working for a community, working with the community or mm -hmm. our community. Yeah, those are very good. I, um, I'm wondering if there are other questions coming from the audience, but um, I actually really want to highlight uh, the unique position uh, Hyphen Labs fills, uh, you know, in the arts. Uh, your practice, as we've uh, seen with all these, you know, uh, very diverse projects, it's very expansive and you're touching upon um, a lot of uh, late technology, cutting edge technology, uh, which in and, in and of itself isn't uh, maybe very well known by the larger public, right? And uh, on top of this, you're uh, making this connection because we are all at this point, I think, familiar with the technologist, you know, the, the technologist mindset, which believes that um, anything can be sold with technology and the more digitized we are, the more technological we are. And I'm using the word technology in, in the colloquial way, right? I'm not talking about techne and, you know, uh, weaving being a technology. I'm not talking about any of those things or corn. In a, it just be, I'm talking about like what we understand when we say just like the high tech, like the new phones, etc. So you're already like, you know, in that uh, kind of, uh, let's say, um, landscape, but um, you are also reaching out to something um, which could sometimes be considered antagonistic to technology, which is, you know, uh, the natural world and uh, us humans and uh, non-human animals as part of this natural world and uh, how we are built as natural entities. Like, I think your sleep project is both hilarious and very smart in that it really highlights uh, one aspect of uh, being an animal, which is we all need to rest. Right. And we don't even know what's going on when we're sleeping, uh, why the brain needs to sleep, uh, you know, uh, what's actually going on. We're learning more and more every year, but we still don't know. And as you said, it's like the last frontier, right? Um, accessing dreams. There's actually some um, speculative fiction out there where, you know, uh, dreams are also marketed and sold. So there's definitely. It's not just know, fiction. Yeah, it's, happen it's, hap it's gonna happen. It's happen so. I mean, even yeah. there's like fear <laughs> companies that are doing like tests that not tests, but making advertisements and like bringing it into yeah um, the commercial space. There's it's definitely um, yeah, it's it's definitely the last holdouts, and, but and I think this is another thing that makes your studio you know uh, unique that uh, you're looking at all these technologies which is likely to uh, get integrated in, in the near future. But again, you're expanding to, you know, larger concepts like, you know, capitalism and um, climate change and how all of these get connected, which I think is very rare. And um, I personally wanted to thank you for this uh, very cerebral, but simultaneously very empathetic work. Because, um, you know, it's, not very common, I have to say. Now, my two questions are, and let me check the time, um, are this. Uh, the second one is maybe simpler. Um, so I'll go with, with the first one. And this is, I'm asking this uh, particularly for our audience, uh, for our students, for my students. Uh, it was wonderful to see uh, those slides where you talked about your practice and your process, right? And collaboration. Now thinking about, again, back to your unique position, like um, we are here at UCSC on a STEM campus. So if I'm like walking back to classroom, which I'll do very soon, right? I'll be passing by a bunch of labs and then collaboration is literally how they work like there's no singular uh, science lab where there's one scientist in a lab thinking, you know, unless they're doing, you know, theoretical math or something. So you're actually practicing something that's 
very you know common in the sciences and in engineering i wanted to ask you um, also you know for our students um and when you're you know seeking collaborators um especially uh, from other disciplines like how do you initiate contact and what are your experiences working with you know different groups I'm sorry, kindergarten level maybe, but important. <laughs> um, we find collaborators all, I mean, all different ways, but like a lot, like when I first, before I even went to school and met Ejen, I was like curious about, or maybe it was the after school. Yeah, I think it was after school. Um, I would just volunteer at, festivals that were in my space um, and this was before we were like invited to speak at festivals mm -hmm. and I got to know we got to know a lot of artists that way and and see their see their work and learn about who they are and what they're doing mm -hmm. um, and then like following them on social media reaching out to them on social media uh, that's what socials has been great for because it you can showcase your work and you can see other people's work and see like how they're thinking and what they're doing um mm. and so i think that has been a good way and for i think us. one thing that is has been really helpful are the residencies so we were residents in new ink uh part of new museum and that mm -hmm. was kind of like a, and these and, and the other one is somerset house and all of these places they kind of keep the community together, not just the present community, but their alumni as well. So you are constantly in conversation with a lot of those mm -hmm. people. And then it's it's been great, just like you're asking, okay, we're working on this project, looking for a 3JS uh, developer. Who do you trust? Who do you work with? And then you kind of like get to know a lot of people. Also, one thing that really helped us was when we first started doing the vr project just want to mention this because i think it's really really uh, Winslow. yeah just really really uh we're really grateful you know we were at new ink and we didn't have the equipment to run a powerful vr experience and we had our neighbors next to we our desk. Our, like 2012 Win MacBooks. That yeah. were, like you couldn't do anything <laughs> and then we had winslow and melissa from uh, new reality uh, so Winslow gave us their, his computer, and that's how we were. That's how we managed to build the first uh, kind of prototype, so we could get into the festivals. You know, so those places where you are like, just apply to a lot of residencies. I think there are great places to find collaborators, partners, new and projects. Like that small action of him doing that for us, then we also gave one of our like VR computers to one of the emerging artists that we were working with so that she could, um, you know, use mm -hmm. and explore um, because you need powerful equipment. So like, yeah, fostering, like, you know, having a reciprocal relationship with the technology so that you can like increase not only your own access to it, but other people's um, that's great. Um, now, let me see if we are we are having other questions. Again, audience, what are your questions? My question, and I don't even know if I should ask this because I want to talk to you about a lot of different things too, but um, yeah, NFTs. <laughs> so I just want to, you know, personally hear your take on this. And for our audience, maybe we can also explain a little bit what uh, non-fungible tokens are it's one of those acronym acronyms that is more confusing when you I actually it say it. Nice fucking tits. yeah like uh, so um what is your take i i put, picked that one up because you know again working in the intersection of technology and let's say biology ecology this is something that people ask me all the time and you know i want to see what you're thinking well i thought you're what you're thinking I thought your first question was the hard one. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, you said you said your first question was going to be the hard one. But yeah, I this thought is this harder. one was easy because it's just like, what are your thoughts on NFTs? You know, it's not like 
Can you please elaborate on the complexities and intricacies of being an I mean, the, the, environmental activist? Yeah. Very apart polarizing from the, uh, the question. Or yeah, the answer. Apart, you know, we might yeah. gain fans or lose fans. <laughs> I think You're apart from the fans. environmental yeah. yeah, apart from the environmental impact, which I mean obviously we can talk about, but it's meant to be something very as I say, the decentralized, let's say, like uh, uh, the technology that it lives on, but it's yeah. so exclusive. Is, is that exclusive? Like it's excluding a lot of people with the complicated language, with co how complicated it works, you know, and it's not making mm -hmm. it easy for people to understand it. And I think that's something that we want to talk about if we were to ever uh, contribute to the, not just the conversation, but the actual kind of the NFT world. Right. Um, the flatness yeah or, yeah it's the intellectual flatness yeah exactly that. exactly and then like i guess that's what we do with our work like you were mentioning you know like how can we start different conversations about the technologies that's used and also like i want to make it so that my mom can understand it you know like it's <laughs> or like our moms can understand it you know like yeah. or, or the little kids can understand it. it's such yeah. a such a i don't know they're and I think they're purposefully making that conversation complex hmm. so that they can leave a lot of people out. I, I don't know. That's something that I've been thinking about. Like, how can we hmm. make it easy for people to grasp what it is and what damage it does and actually what it tries, what, what does it try to make? I mean, it's not, it, it's, it's a great way for a lot of people to also earn money, you know? Right. I think it's, it's been a great a place for a lot of digital artists that didn't have maybe a I don't know a great business model beforehand but right I mean, right it's just such a big topic I don't know I mean climate parts obviously I guess like we all know I just don't want to mention that but right I mean, that's my take. I mean, supposedly for the past like two years ethereum is going to go into a proof of stake or some kind of alternative or I think also what where we I think one of our principles is this like, yes, and. So when the question mm -hmm. is like, are we into NFTs? And it's like, well, yes. yes and. and we <laughs> want to create work that uses the language, yeah. the visuals, the everything, yeah. the NFTs to critique the NFT, the ransomware, the scamming, right. the um, like community or whatever right. that's being made and on Discord. I think like it's, it's so interesting how it arrived at this point when we're heavily reliant on our technology. So for those who are connecting through Discord or through um, the different platforms that are like right. creating community, it's it's kind of work happened at a perfect time. And um, we, I, I think it would be kind of, ridiculous to say like oh I don't want to participate in it because I simultaneously participate in capitalism which is a terribly flawed system an exploitative mm -hmm. system and um but how can we create it and how can we create a model that's more like a library rather than focuses on ownership that mm -hmm. um and the thing is that like Edge always tells me when the dollar was made the fake dollar was made Mm -hmm. Even in ourselves, we have the, we have our light and our shadow. We have, mm -hmm. there's, there's always the yin and the yin, the good and the mm -hmm. evil. And so just okay. there's always somebody that's going to be exploiting it, you know, like whatever yeah. tech is made, you know, it's just like it, even the knife, you know, I think like also Bjork was saying that like you invented the knife and like how you use it just like depend on like what sort of person you want to become or what sort of legacy you want to leave on. So mm -hmm. yeah. I guess Bjork yeah. says that Bjork has a quote about knives. I think so. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I think so. I think so. Okay. Uh, this this is definitely the trivia of the day for me. But... Yeah. I, I'm going to find oh, it and send Bjork, it to you. You're Bernard, so yeah. wise. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. What about um, you? Are you, where, where, is but i mean well, quite, yeah yeah i mean back when i had twitter because i um 
I uh, can't, uh, what is it, terminated my Twitter when I was uh, in Turkey for four months uh, in Erdogan's Turkey, because I posted some wildfire related uh, stuff and then got a bunch of trolls. But right before I deleted, I had one tweet about NFTs, which is non-feminist tech bro art. That was my you know, exactly. definition of NFTs, because I looked at the work and just like you said, I found the work um, that I'm seeing or that gains huge popularity to be um, conceptually flat. And I wasn't sure about the medium or whether the medium is, you know, um, supportive enough for research based artistic practices. Because I think like the the phenomenon that we're all in, you know, you, your, your hyphen labs and uh, the arts community who is interested in this intersection of arts, technology, future and nature, right? Um, it's research based. So it's not like you can't have an elevator pitch or a one liner or it's not just uh, about, you know, a pure, uh, what is it? Cortical pleasure, uh, cortical, not the right word, but um, optical pleasure. Like the work is really about, um, you know, research itself. So then Again, I think we'll all have to invent, and I'm thinking about this actively, like how can we invent uh, methods? Yeah, uh, I mean, we felt exactly that way with VR. It was like yeah. really demo mode. And yeah. And we were able to formulate a, and create a scenario in which like, we're not gonna actually change anybody's brains. Although there are people who are in the biohacking. But you did. Um, like space, but, we, but right. we weren't actually going to physically go and give some type of voltage through like. Um, yeah, yeah, no zapping. No, yeah. um, I, 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 we could simulate that, what that could I, look I, like. I found the quote, by the way, I, and I want to really uh, <laughs> sell it to everyone. We should here. end with that since it's time yeah. is up now, but what is the quote? So she says, um, about technology and culture, it's a, it's a Guardian actually um, uh, article, and they quoted, are we gonna be lazy or let them stimulate us to be expressive? Are we going to create or destroy? Doesn't matter if it was fire, the knife, the gun, the atom bomb, tech, or whatever. These mm -hmm. things don't come with humanity or a soul. We have to put it there. And I think it's really, really important and like talks about the NFT as well, you know? Yeah, yeah, it does. So it's our responsibility to make it meaningful. Yeah. yeah. To give it a soul. And so, to... yes, yeah, she has a quote with knife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much. It's time. Nice. And I know you're in two different time zones. We're all like, uh, you know, um, enjoying the beautiful day in California, but I know it's late for you. So, um, Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today uh, in this, you know, wonderful talk by Hyphen Labs. Um, again, uh, stay tuned and follow their work. Who knows what next they're going to come up with? You know, they're always like following the latest uh, developments. Um, thank you so much. And um, bye, everyone. Thank you, Carmen and Eje. Thanks bye, for having thank us. You. Bye. Can we talk now? Are we still recording? <laughs> are we live still? I think. Are we live? No, I think. No, no, no.